So Mr. Mark Quinn, you've had windshield time lately and you've been listening to some books on tape and just like that, the magic that you work, all of a sudden you're like, we should have this guy that you've been listening to this book on tape on the podcast. And he was kind enough to join us in the podcast. So he was, but I, before we move past what you just said, I would like to correct for the record that books on tape are prop like that's five, maybe 10 years ago. There's no tape. It's, it's audible, right? It's digital Kinsley. Why did I say book on tape? I used to make fun of my friend. He would, (laughs) he would drive along with this cassette player just a few years ago, listening to Dave Ramsey on tape. I'm like, dude, you just get the app and download it. So an audio. Can you even, is there a place to put a tape anywhere? Anyway? Uh, anyway, I'll show you, I'll show you where to put the tape. (laughs) I had to call you out on that. No, David. So I, you know, all the stuff that you and I've been doing and talking about with Nationwide, um, been looking into, and the fact that we both have our own entrepreneurial spirit and, and ventures out that way, I, I came across this book called Soul of an Entrepreneur, and I read a little bio on it, and I'm like, you know what, that sounds really good. So yes, I was listening to it, and Kinsley, you and I have talked about how with a lot of business books, you get kind of like halfway through them, and you're like, this is so freaking boring, or they lose you or they stop talking about stuff that's all that relevant. David held my attention all the way through and I really thought it was great content and it would be perfect for this audience. So why don't you tell us a little bit about him and then we'll jump right into it. Well, super excited to have David Sachs uh, come, coming at us from uh, Toronto, Canada, journalist and author. He's written for Business Week and the New York Times. Uh, his books include Save the Deli, Tastemakers, two separate books, the Revenge of Analog and the audiobook that Mr. Quinn listened to, not the book on tape. The Soul of an Entrepreneur. David, welcome to the show. What did we miss there? Thanks, Marx. Uh, well, uh, they're all available in paper as well as audio format. So uh, digital, analog, audible, um, tactile, whatever format you like your words in, you can get them wherever finer books are sold or wherever audible. the finest books are sold. I, you know, I have to, I have to jump in and, and ask like a contextual question yeah, yeah. because the revenge of analog, mm. uh, l- let's go back to that one. Like, how do you look at kind of the arguments you were making in the direction of things in that book compared to where we've arrived in this post or current COVID world? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, uh, because obviously that book based on the title looked at the resurgence and growth and the kind of like enduring value of non-digital goods and experiences over the past decade. You know, why have vinyl records seen a comeback? Why have bookstores been growing like crazy for the past decade? Um, All these things that we had dismissed as irrelevant um, and that would have been supplanted by digital technology. Uh, What was the sort of reason behind that? And when COVID first started and, you know, world went into lockdown um a lot of people said well now that's just going to show that it's the opposite of that because like everything's digital now and it had to be but what's been really interesting is how much interest i've gotten i've I've almost gotten as much interest um than the current one which is like four weeks old because you know, I had a chapter on education and the value of like teachers. And it was this sort of debatable thing. And now anyone who has a kid that's been doing zoom classes is like, yes, no, this, this is not the way to go. Like there's, you know, digital education is like something most people want to be done with as quickly as possible. It's not this future that's been predicted for us. And, uh, and I think in a lot of ways, like you guys deal a lot with retail, you know, I think we're seeing the value of retail beyond just price and selection. We're seeing the value of those businesses in our communities. We're seeing what they're actually able to do in terms of bringing people together, in terms of serving them in that way. Um, and the value of going to be able to shop in a store, right? It's, it's one thing where you, you know, you can do online for some stuff, but like if you can not go in a store as many of us have not done and shopped in a store for a couple of months, it's, it's a whole other ball game. And you realize very quickly the valuable, the value of the thing that you had taken for granted. There's a lot there. Um, And we talk a lot about experience, David, for stores. Mm -hmm. So I know that that's part of kind of that, that whole 
definition. So yeah, we, we agree. Um, we think there's a lot uh, of value and we had a futurist on um, that was talking a lot about that too. So either you are a place to go for an experience or you're selling pl- things that's just a transaction. Uh, but the people who really carve out some unique space and use some creativity and do some cool things in store to create experiences, those are the ones that will survive and thrive. So it sounds like it's really in line with kind of where you were going. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, you know, again, like if you focus entirely on the utility of stuff and the transactional cost of it, you know, digital is, is going to win out most times. Um, but we don't just buy things. We don't just transact. We don't interact. We don't learn entirely in a transactional, you know, highly efficient way. It's the inefficiencies. It's the things that make us get out and go somewhere and, and take time and effort that actually provides us with the richness. Um, whether that's in a work type of experience, or whether it's sort of in a pleasure type of experience. Uh, and I think we're seeing that now because as we're denied, you know, the physical versions of uh, the real versions of so many experiences, we quickly see the value of, of the parts of it that we may have seen as, you know, inefficient, right? Don't know what you have until it's gone. Totally agree with that. Um, let's get into your current book. So it's four weeks old. It's called yeah, Soul of an Entrepreneur. Yeah. Who knows how much time is worth these days? Who's counting? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Two months, um, know, four weeks. Uh, and so um, anyway, I, like I said, I was listening to the book and, and found it really fascinating. And let's just start with this. So the definition of an entrepreneur, what I, what I found really interesting right from the beginning was, you know, there is this really beautiful, rosy picture of being 23 years old, having a business idea and coming out and being Serge or Zuckerberg and creating Facebook or Google, one of these things, and then hitting it big and, and launching into this thing where you've got a billion dollars in your bank account. And that is certainly a type of entrepreneur. But David, you mentioned that they've they've kind of hijacked the definition of an entrepreneur a little bit to where that's kind of how people are thinking of what an entrepreneur is, but that's not the full picture. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's kind of what got me into to be interested in the book because what I was seeing was that people were talking about entrepreneurs more than ever. It was sort of the word was elevated in our culture, right? They were on the covers of magazines and it was, you know, entrepreneurs are the new rock stars, you know, entrepreneurs are sexy. Um, But it was, it was focused on one very specific type of entrepreneur, which is a pretty rare, a rare bird, right? The, the young 20 something genius coder founder who creates the company and gets all the venture capital funding and becomes a billionaire overnight. Like, most entrepreneurs don't look like that. that. That represents a fraction of a percentage of entrepreneurs who are even pursuing that type of business. Um, so where, how do we get off of that? And what, what did entrepreneur really look, what do entrepreneurs really look like? What does it really, does entrepreneurship really look like, you know, for most entrepreneurs out there? What's the deeper meaning of the word? And there's a lot to that. Um, and it, so you, one example of that you talk about in the book, um, a, a certain type of entrepreneur was your friend who was into baking, um, and ended up, she's a surfer, right? On East coast. Uh, and, yeah, I met Tracy. Um, yes. Uh, sorry, go on. You no, that's okay. And what I liked about it is, is you call it, I can't recall cause I couldn't take notes cause I was driving. I, I'm a good, <laughs> good. Guy. I keep my hand, good I keep my hands on the sorry. wheel. Yeah. Um, but she was, uh, you, you called it like it was a lifestyle entrepreneur. Yeah. So in other words, they kind of work to live and they're not necessarily trying to make that big hit, but you know, she doesn't want to be under someone else's control, but she liked the idea of being able to do her own thing. So talk a little bit about that type of entrepreneur. Right. Yeah. So what I, what I really wanted to do was move beyond the stereotype of what an entrepreneur looks like in the Silicon Valley startup world and that myth. Um, to the deeper meanings uh, of entrepreneurship for all the different people who you know start their own businesses, own their own businesses, run a business, because um, for each of them it's different. I sort of divided them into different types, right? Uh, and, and so the lifestyle, the lifestyle entrepreneur is really someone who's an entrepreneur to run a lifestyle business, and a lifestyle business is defined. It was really only defined like the 1980s as you know, a business that provides for 
the lifestyle of its owners, right? Which I think is most businesses with the exception of the very few that go public um, or sell for like a tremendous amount to someone else. Most businesses fall into that category. My own life as a you know writer, my wife's business as a career coach, my grandfather's business as a you know owning a tool company in Montreal, which is still in operation. I mean, those are all lifestyle businesses. Most of the stores that you probably deal with, most mattress companies, um, uh, and, and yet that term had become kind of a, a derogatory term in the world of of the Silicon Valley startup myth, in the world of entrepreneurship. Um, studies and, and, and advocacy, it's like, oh, what you, you, that just sounds like a lifestyle business. Just sounds like you want a lifestyle business. Like that's not going to give me a 10 X or a hundred X return on my capital. So why would I even consider that? It's sort of insufficiently ambitious, but most entrepreneurs desire that. Like that's the most desirable thing. It's like, oh, I can start a business and it will make money and allow me to do the things I want to do in my life, whether it's mountain biking, like, Mark what likes to do or whatever it is, Bobby, you like to do. You're also Mark. So pickleball covered cover, pickleball, <laughs> right? Playing small tennis in your backyard. Um, uh, you know, whatever that is, you're able to do that and you can have a house and you can send your kids to college and you can save money and you get to charity and you can do all the other things that matter to you. And you could do something that you actually enjoy. Like to most people, that is the pinnacle of success. That's, that is, a, that is the American dream or Canadian dream as, as we call it up here or whatever, you know, wherever you live, right? Um, but that had been devalued so much. And so Tracy Abalski, uh, who I met when I was researching the book, you know, she, she was living that dream. And that dream for her was like, she had started surfing. She was a New York City pastry chef. She was getting all sorts of great write-ups and reviews and awards, but she was slogging it out in basement kitchens for male chefs who were, you know, uh, not being kind to the women they worked with. And a few of them, you know, lost their jobs because of that and just being jerks generally. And, you know, the restaurant business is a grind. And she's like, I took up surfing. I live by the beach. I don't even get to go to the beach and surf. I don't want to be here in Manhattan slogging it out. I want my own thing. I, and, and, you know, she, she quit her job, which was like the day her life transformed and opened up a bakery in a broken down shack in a fishing marina. And she sold like ham and cheese croissants that she baked to salty fishermen named Frank the Fish who would take her out, you know, for a ride to watch the sunset on their boat. You know, and to her, it was heaven. It was paradise. She wakes up every morning, at, you know, before sunrise. She goes surfing she pedals her bike down the boardwalk to open up her own bakery. She works hard. She's, you know, wrestling dough and making croissants and baking breads and pies and coffee. She basically runs the place herself. She works all day till four o'clock, closes up, goes home, goes surfing, has dinner, goes to bed, repeats it. And that to her is like, that's success. She's not going to become a millionaire off this, but she's making money, she's paying her rent, you know, and, and she's living, uh, the life that gives her happiness. What could be wrong with that? But to many people who write about entrepreneurship, study entrepreneurship, advocate for it, you know, that's not sufficiently entrepreneurial because she doesn't want to crush it. She doesn't want to win. She's not trying to become the next Starbucks. But for most entrepreneurs, they're not. And so you, you started slicing this thing out hmm. and so what are the four categories? So that's lifestyle. Was the other category just like the big go get them type of businesses? What do you call that? I mean, it's not, it's not clear cut. Right. And, and, and I don't really define it into this, into, you know, clear verticals. I told a bunch of different stories that span that. I think the reality is every single entrepreneur has a reason why they started doing what they're doing and a reason why they continue to do it. And that reason is their motivation, their North star, their why, whatever the heck you want to call it. That is, that is the reason why they're an entrepreneur. Um, and that more than anything is, is what really defines entrepreneurs. And then you, you sort of back it out into what that actually looks like. Um, so, you know, I wanted to tell stories that were beyond that idea of the sort of, you know, titan of industry, Elon Musk, Ayn Rand, you know, fantasy figure um, uh, that 
was the one that people typically associate with an entrepreneur and, it, and, and say, look, it's so much more than that. It can be someone who has a lifestyle business. It could be someone who does it and really they're basing what they're doing off their personal values, whether those are religious values or spiritual values or just values around a certain type of community. Um, it could be someone who's you know, working with legacy as their primary motivator and that's in a family business, for example. Um, uh, or just someone who's you know wedded to ideas, but it, being an entrepreneur is is this far greater thing, and yet so much more personal, right? It's so completely defined by every single individual, which is why you can have t- five mattress companies starting out of the same town in Arkansas or wherever. Um, uh, I don't know where Mark Quinn lives, um, uh, and they'll be Close completely enough. different. Uh, is he not? Is he not in uh, Arkansas? Like Missouri, but that's okay. We're like an hour away. It's fine. What uh, What other state is? What's like uh, Alabama, Missouri, Missouri? Okay. So I'm in Missouri, and that's about an hour and a half, uh, an hour and five or ten minutes actually from where Kinsley is, and he's in Northwest Arkansas where Walmart is. Oh, I so. see. Okay, so right there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can have five of those places owned by five different entrepreneurs, and they'll all be completely different based on that journey, those personal circumstances, their personality, their history, who they are, what they believe in, um, their backgrounds, the advantage and privilege they may have, right, uh, going into it. And, and that's, that's, you know, it's something that should defy standardization, because it's about the individual's journey through business, through commerce. And yet, we often try to standardize it so many ways. Oh, you want to succeed in business? You want to be an entrepreneur? Here's what you need. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You know, you got a one, write your business plan. Two, get up there on demo day. Three, crush it. Blah, blah, blah. You know, drink this energy drink. And, you know, listen to this one podcast, except your podcast. That's one they should all listen to. Um, uh, and, and it just becomes, you know, didactic in a way. Like, it's just this, like, prescriptive thing. But it's it's as individual as every, as anything else It's been individuals, all our personalities. And that's what makes it interesting, right? That's what makes it unique. Whenever you look at some of the stories that you gathered up and you ended up putting in the book, love the story about the lady who decided I want to surf, I want to bake, and then I want to go surf some more. And then I want to go to bed and wake up and do it again. I love that. Are there some other stories out there that stand out as some of your favorites or some of the ones that kind of illustrate some different points that you like? I mean, the total opposite of that is, you know, Jessica Dupart, who is uh, a, a black woman from New Orleans who started doing hair, you know, in her parents' house in like junior high. Um, she would like braid her friend's hair in the bathroom while her parents were like, what are you doing in there? She's like, nothing, nothing. You're know, like sneaking them out the window. Um, and then started working in salons and owned a salon and that one burned down and had another one. Katrina came that flooded it out. Like she, you know, she had to go to Houston and she was doing hair, like basically like anywhere she could. Um, and always just like loved doing it was really into her community and hustling, hustling. And then she started selling hair products out of her salon, but by her own brand name kaleidoscope and started making videos online and was really good at making these funny videos and just blew up. And now she's massive. Like she's a huge multimillionaire. The million and a half followers on Instagram has built this national brand in really like a very short period of time. Um, but like never had an investor, never had, you know, formal business education, like just, just learned how to do it. And for her, you know, for her, it's about making money and, and being successful as big as she can. But like, she wants to bring up other women in her community and show them that entrepreneurship is possible, that you don't have to work for someone and just tell, take what they say. You can do something on your own too. And, and so, you know, in one sense, it's the story of someone who's a tremendous businesswoman, um, really smart, really aggressive and, and a tremendous success. And the other, it's like the point of that success is so other people like me who are generally denied the opportunity to participate in the system and, and benefit from it, like that they know that they can do it and I'm going to teach them how to do it. And she'll speak, she goes on these tours um, just the past couple of years and she'll go around cities and there'll be like five, 6,000 people will show up at some event hall to hear her speak. Um, all, you know, mostly black women like her. And, uh, and it's just amazing. And, you know, she's this tremendous personality, but um, 
doesn't do anything revolutionary. It's, you know, she didn't invent a rocket ship, like she's selling hair products. Um, but to her, it's, 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 she recognized the power that entrepreneurship has um, uh, to be empowered. So, you know, on that note, you talk about in the book, um, some of the reasons that people dive into entrepreneurship. Mm. And I think you just hit on one, it's um, uh, the ability for them to be independent. I, I, I really captured from it, um, people just wanna be in control kind of of their day. That's like such a big driver for people. They just wanna kind of be able to, you know, be the one driving the ship and managing their hours and, you know, telling themselves when they get to take off and when they don't. How, how much of people getting into the entrepreneur space or becoming an entrepreneur is really about that? Or is there another dominant driver or can, is it even fair to say there is a dominant driver for people no, to I mean, become that entrepreneurs? Is, that is, you know, the one thing that every entrepreneur gets is that independence, right? You're not guaranteed success. You're not guaranteed money. You're not guaranteed fame. You're not guaranteed failure. Um, but you're guaranteed independence. You're guaranteed your freedom. So when you start out on your own, whatever business it is, uh, you're guaranteed that you will always have that freedom to do what you want to do. That means succeed as you want to succeed, fail as you want to fail, wear the clothes you want to wear, set the hours you want to set, make the values and priorities, the values and priorities, which again, you know, three different mattress businesses in the same town, they're going to be completely different based upon all the freedom that each of the entrepreneurs has within their to do what they want to do. Um, uh, and, and I think that ultimately is really the thing that drives most people to become entrepreneurs because yes, is there an idea? Is there a market? Is there a desire to sort of make money or, or, or an opportunity that people see? Of course, but the key thing is that only entrepreneurship gives them the freedom to do that, right? They, they can't go and ask their boss, hey, I really think I should start this line of business. It's like they don't have the freedom to decide that. They have to ask permission of it unless they go out on their own and become entrepreneurs. Um, uh, and even in a situation like this with I don't know, 40 million people unemployed in the US, you know, and you're going to see millions of entrepreneurs starting businesses over the next few years just out of necessity, even in a situation like that, you know, those people still experience that fundamental freedom that all entrepreneurs experience because they are able to decide what business they're going to start. They're able to decide where they're going to do it, how they're going to do it, what matters to them, how much they're going to charge, you know, what they're going to do. And so they're not tied to what their previous career was. They're not tied to anything. They have to obviously reflect realities, whether it's economic realities or the other realities of, of their life and the situation, the economy and in society and so on, but uh, they have, as an entrepreneur, you are guaranteed that freedom. You're also guaranteed the thing that comes with that freedom, which is the price of it, and that's risk. Um, financial risk, obviously, which we're seeing, you know, um, the, the immediate consequence of over the past couple of months, um, uh, but also all the other risks, the risk to one's mental health, the risk to one's ego, the risk to your relationship with your family, as you tie that freedom in with your personal identity of who you are, um, you know, in a way that's inseparable uh, compared with working at another company, uh, working for someone else. So the risk is the price of that freedom and you can't have one without the other. No, you can't have the freedom and not have the risk. You can't have the risk without the freedom. It seems like there's been a hyper focus, especially over the past, I would say three to five years on entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. and almost so much visibility that it would seem to nudge people in that direction that maybe shouldn't go in that direction. Do you see like a piece of advice that you would pass along to people as they're thinking, okay, this is a time where I really have a chance to make a decision. Um, maybe I'm facing some of those economic realities that you talked about and I don't have a job waiting for me, but maybe I'm not cut out for this or maybe I'm trying to decide if I'm cut out for this. Do you have some advice that you offer up to people? Yeah, I would say one is like, nobody's cut out for this. <laughs> you know, everybody's cut out for this. Um, there's never a good time to start a business, never a bad time to start a business, like having a child. It is kind of like being becoming a parent, actually. Nobody's cut out for this. 
Um, yet everybody's cut out for this. Uh, there are all kinds of people that become entrepreneurs and live successful, happy, content lives as entrepreneurs. You can be an introvert uh, who is incredibly brilliant. You can be an extrovert who never you know, made it past ninth grade. Uh, it doesn't really matter. There's no, there's no set of qualifications that are, are necessary or guaranteed. And I think that's where a lot of the mythology does a tremendous disservice uh, because we built it up to, it's like, oh, well, you don't look like Steve Jobs. You don't talk like Steve Jobs. And you're not this hyper-confident Gary Vaynerchuk type person. It's like, there are super quiet, super unassuming people who are incredibly successful. And I talked to many of them for this book. Um, it doesn't matter where you are, what your background is. As Jessica Depart showed, you know, you can be a black woman from New Orleans, one of the poorest cities in the nation and, and not have any formal schooling and nobody will give you a loan or anything and still succeed based on everything society is putting against you. Right. Um, or you could be some brilliant kid who gets a bunch of VC funding to do your mattress startup uh, and you went to Stanford and your mattress startup could fail because guess what? You actually have to sell it for more money than it costs to make your mattress. Um, not speaking to anyone specifically in the mattress business, but that I'm talking about. <laughs> if right you guys? were, who would that be? If you were, it would rhyme. Would they be a friendly one or Last not? Year. Yeah. Yeah friendly so friendly it's like like the friend who's like they give it away me too much yeah they're giving it away um uh but but, uh, but, no, but don't go past that though because you, you made a great point because at the end of the day this is the silicon valley thing and you talked yeah. about valuation and one of the big disservices to entrepreneurship is what's your first round of funding right yeah. so what did you raise and that's a measuring stick in that world in terms of like success like you raised a great round of money the reality is the business model doesn't make sense. It's not sustainable. Right. And, and, and it's a, it's a, a mattress it's a isn't software. Um, yeah. It can't, inf you can't infinitely scale a mattress. Right. Right. Um, uh, and, and this has happened in, in so many places. And so this is the, the core, the core thing. So uh, getting back to the, the, the piece of advice, Marque is um, uh, you know, don't think that because you want to start a business, it has to be like you saw on um, Shark Tank, that you have to come up with a brilliant idea and go stand in front of, front of a bunch of wealthy investors, you know, at an angel group or just a bunch of jerks on TV or whatever, and like pitch them this thing. It's like, do you have a product or service that you want to bring to the world and you have the skills to do? Um, great. What are the resources you need for that? Go and do it. Like if you can sell that and make more money than it costs you to sell, you're an entrepreneur. Um, and I think, again, the most important thing, the other thing that people can learn is, is, and this is sort of starting and also like throughout the course of their lives and careers is, you know, success is not this linear thing. And I think that's the other thing that the, the, the Silicon Valley myth gets wrong and um, says like, okay, you're going to start your business and here's your valuation. Next year, it's going to be double and then triple that. And then boom, you're going to IPO. And then, you know, whatever happens, happens. And you're going to be so rich. It's not even going to matter. And that, that, that's not, it's not a, it, it's not a story with a beginning, middle and an end. Entrepreneurship is this lifelong thing. It can be multi-generational. Both of you guys work for companies that are like a hundred and something years old. Right. Um, uh, and, and in that hundred something years old, it's not this like one straight line that just continually goes up into the, the right um, in this beautiful curve. It's ups and downs and peaks and valleys and recessions and pandemics and depressions and, and good times and bad times and personal challenges and sickness and health and births and all these things in the family that get twisted in with that. And success is more about getting back to that fundamental thing of like, why did I start this company? Why did I start this business? Why did I go out and decide to work for myself as I did, right? Um, uh, was it to make a lot of money? Maybe that was a dream, but like, you can't judge yourself on that because first of all, you make a lot of money, you're gonna wanna make a lot more. So like, where's the next thing up? And second of all, like most people don't achieve that fairy tale ending, you know? Would I love to write a New York Times best-selling book? Yes. Have I done it? No. Um, will I hope that it'll happen next time? Sure. But is that the reason I keep writing books? No. 
it's not to make a lot of money, but I make enough that it provides for this house that we're sitting in and, um, you know, whatever groceries I now buy for hundreds of dollars more than I used to buy. <laughs> Just buying dumb stuff and I'm going grocery shopping. Um, uh, uh, it's so I have the ability to do the work I want to do. So I can go out and interview people and ask questions that I want to ask and tackle a subject that only I can tackle. And a book is a way to do that, that even writing articles for magazines, newspapers, like I have to answer to editors. I have to do it. This is like my thing. So what is your reason for doing that? And whether you're doing it out of necessity because you lost your job or whether you're doing it out of, opportunity and some brilliant innovation or like most entrepreneurs a mix of necessity and opportunity you need to have that in mind and constantly remind yourself of that because when times are good when times are bad you're going to get whipsawed through all these emotions and and the psychological journey of being an entrepreneur and it's coming back to that fundamental reason the reason you're doing it the reason you start it the reason you continue to do it what is that deeper meaning of it for you what is the what is the freedom that you're indulging as an entrepreneur? What is the reason why you're, why you're taking on the burden of the risk that comes with that? That, that is that, that deeper thing that all entrepreneurs need to keep in mind. Because if you're like, I'm going to start a mattress company, I'm going to make a billion dollars. Well, good luck, right? But it's like, I'm going to start a mattress company because I firmly believe that you know, the ducks that are used in mattress down are not raised correctly. And I believe that there's a better way to raise ducks or whatever. It's like, okay, great, go and do that. And if you can bit, make one mattress off that and sell it, you've already achieved that first level. Like you'll be, you'll be content in what you're doing. You know, we talked to our friends in, in Italy and it's funny when you look at catalogs of businesses, there are over a thousand registered mattress manufacturers in the country of Italy. And that's because some people just have a little garage dedicated to making a few mattresses every week or every month awesome. and they sell them to their neighbors, just like they do with clothing. And my friend Alberto is telling me about this and I'm like, that's, that's a lifestyle business in the mattress industry. And so, you know, companies that go to Italy and try to try to scale some of the componentry that you put inside of a mattress, it didn't really work that way because there are so many backyard businesses dedicated to bedding. Right. Um, they just want to find for themselves. And, and it's not, you know, the economists, um, there's children in the background, but you know, what are you going to do? It's 2020. That's where we live. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have dogs, so just wait till we, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's framed by economists and, and business professors like, well, that's not so efficient. What's efficient is, you know, one giant mattress company that can make, you know, most mattresses for the least amount of money. And, and that's what will give consumers the best value. And, and, and that's what entrepreneurship is about. It's about finding that one company that will deliver, you know, returns to investors. And it's like, yeah, but we, that, we don't just want that, right? That doesn't serve everybody. Yes, well, to give everyone something to sleep on, great. Like my kid sleeps on an Ikea mattress. Okay, cool, right? I wasn't going to spend more because he was still peeing. Um, uh, that's another episode. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's being the bed yes and the, and, the, and, and the mattress industry and its effect gotcha. on, on sales which is i assume good um uh God, i lost my train of thought my god we encourage kids peeing on beds that's I think what that we're all about at the this has been brought to you by grape juice <laughs> <Today's episode. laughs> it's Warm no, but I, I think it's that idea that you know especially in the united states um you know there has been a a intellectual sort of conversation around entrepreneurship and capitalism over the past half century and it's sort of started with milton friedman and ayn rand and kind of has continued up through silicon valley and it's like what matters is the biggest and the biggest winners and the best i mean you know mark hey you're in you're in bentonville arkansas you're in you know the land of the biggest company um it's like what matters is is not you know mom and pop grocery stores it's creating the next walmart creating the next amazon creating the next sealy or casper or whatever and and you know because that drives gdp growth and it drives jobs and it drives the tax revenue and that's the, the big thing you know we need those big winners and like yes it's good to have those things but then you think of a country like Italy and you're like, but it's also nice that someone is going to be able to make a craft mattress business or in another way, a craft brewery, right? Yes. Can we have Molson, Imbev, Coors, Sapporo, whatever other like two conglomerates there are in beer? Of course. But we love, we all love the fact that now in the past decade, 
every small town, every like small city has its craft breweries. Um, and you can go get not just a, a Coors Light, but you can get like some weird skunky bong watery IPA made from grape skins or whatever um, that someone's doing. And it's like, you want all of that. You, you need that. That's, it's that diversity of the economy. And that's what entrepreneurship's about. It's, it's why you guys talk about independent businesses and independent stores. You know, it's, you know, could you buy a mattress at, at Amazon? Can you buy a mattress at Walmart? Can you buy a mattress at Ikea? Like four other places? Sure. But there's also a value in that small store that sells it. There's, there's a value that goes beyond just the dollars and cents, the value that goes beyond the economics. And I think that's, that's what entrepreneurship is ultimately about. Like, it's about business, but it's so much more of a deeper human story. It's about people's creativity and ideals and their value and their identity finding its way into the world through commerce. Um, uh, and we kind of do a disservice to that when we talk about it just in purely economic means. I heard a lady on the news the other night, and I think she was in New Orleans, and she had some business that dealt with food. And she, she captured it so perfectly. She says, without businesses like us, there's no taste. And without that taste, the city has no flavor. Oh, and I, if you've been to New Orleans, I mean, it is an incredibly like, you know, backward place business-wise. You know, if you go into any of those restaurants and you're like, oh, well, this is, you know, not the most efficient food service operation because, you know, you should have the thing streamlined. And they're like, honey, we've been doing this for 120 years. They're like, we're going to put on a tuxedo and flambe this banana table side for you because it's going to be delicious and fun. Like have another 12 drinks and 19 oysters cooked in butter and, you know, a duck or whatever. Like that's the joy of that place. That's the beauty of it, right? Otherwise, everything's just like a TGI Fridays. Um, and efficiency isn't always the best and 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 there's room for all those different types of entrepreneurs right you need a starbucks so that when you go to a anywhere you can have that consistent you know coffee and you can go to an airport and you know you're going to get your venti latte or whatever the heck it is and your your thing and then you need a place like tracy abolski's rockray beach bakery which is like entirely based in that place it's got its feeling it's got its thing like the sun is really just like i don't know I'm just gonna that's all right we'll it's have fun. him on later yeah, for sure. Um, uh, I hope you like talking about ninjas on the podcast, guys. We do. That is <laughs> the ninja waiter. Ninja waiter. That's is, is a ninja waiter. So somewhere someone is opening up a restaurant that's like a ninja themed restaurant. And maybe it's crazy and maybe it's a bad business idea. But like for that entrepreneur who happens to be my three-year-old son, like that is his expression of his personal thing. And it, that's what adds to the, you know, that's what makes communities what there are. And, and I think about the past couple of months, you know, during this pandemic of like, everything's so local, right? You like really stay around your neighborhood. You're, you're really like noticing the value of the stores that are still open. And it's like, like, that's the most beautiful thing is like seeing the value of these businesses, you know, Grace Meats, the little uh, Jewish owned Italian butcher shop. That's, uh, you know, a block away from my street where you can get fresh ricotta and capicola. And you can also get like latkes and, you know, Jewish deli stuff. Like it, it's, it's like quirky and tiny. You could barely walk in there. Um, uh, and yet that's that beautiful thing. It's that expression of business. There's a, a bar that was, you know, now they're selling beer. They made their own little store and like, they're selling all their weirdest stuff. Cause they're like, yeah, you can still get the stuff at the grocery store. We're going to sell the really strange stuff that nobody else can sell. It's that, you know, that, again, that individualized aspect of it. It's like, it's so it's human. It's personal. And that's, that's really what entrepreneurship is. Let's, I mean, you, you can just like armchair quarterback this, but I have to take that stream of thought and that example of something really boutique -y and neighborhoody and old and very specific, and then take it to the mattress industry where we have the, the flavor of our business is the independent retailer. What, what would you say to somebody out there that maybe isn't telling that story or needs to use this as a chance to rethink their business and their approach in their marketplace. I'm totally armchair quarterback at knowing what you know, but what would you, t what would your advice to people be? Well, again, it's like, what is the reason you're doing it? Right. What is your, what is your, what is your essential truth as an entrepreneur, as a mattress retailer or a furniture retailer? Right. Is it, is it to sell the, 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 the most thing at the lowest possible price? Is it to sell the highest quality thing? Is it to give people something that, that is, you know, ecologically the most sound? I mean, 
you know, what is your reason is your story because that's the thing that you actually believe in. That's the reason you decided to do it. The reason you keep doing it. Um, uh, and if that is, that's the thing that speaks to you, then you're going to speak to your customers about that in a way that will connect with them genuinely. I think that's the truth. You know, my sister-in-law just had a baby, I don't know, like three weeks ago. And, um, she wants us to buy as a gift, a mattress for the crib, but she's a, she's like a real ecological, um, you know, environmental hippie. I mean, she, she works for an environmental organization. Like she's very much into that. She bought her last mattress. It was like a made in Quebec latex, but like, uh, you know, certified organic everything. And she wants that for the baby, which of course like the most expensive mattress for a child. Um, uh, and that's why but, she wants you to buy it for her. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, uh, okay. There was a limit on this, but anyway. Um, but you know, she's, that's not a mattress that I'm going to buy at the giant, you know, mattress store that I bought it uh, at. It's, it's a mattress that's only found in like these select retailers of like eco home or eco baby or these sorts of things where you can go to those places and they really like, their reason for doing it, their mission statement, their story is at the center of that brand. And you go there and you believe in that, you know, it, it, it's story is genuine. It's real. It's not something like a marketing company came up with. And I think for any retailer or any business, uh, whether you're manufacturing or whether you're distributing or, or, or especially obviously consumer facing, you know, that, that story, like the more genuine and truthful it is, the more honest you're going to be able to communicate that versus like, what are our values? Let's hire a consultant to help us find them. Right. So be who you are. So authenticity uh, yeah. is, is very important to boil kind of some of what you said down. In another, another part of it, David, in, in hearing your book, um, I really loved how you told the stories about the different entrepreneurs because you brought forward the passion mm -hmm. that these people have for their life, for maintaining their life, but for starting their business and for making sure that business works, because if you don't have that passion, it is never going to work because it's hard uh, to be an entrepreneur and the risk you have to take and the mental game you have to play. So anyway, but passion also can be tricky because in some of these generational businesses, right? So dad started or granddad started this business. It's been in the family for, you know, 30, 40, 50, a hundred years, whatever it is. Now you got family members involved. That stuff gets really tricky really fast, right? And you had a really interesting story about a friend of yours uh, in South America with a vineyard. You want to kind of tell a little bit about that and then maybe just kind of as you tell that story, um, maybe reflect on the impact, um, you, know, you know, be careful. You, I mean, the family can be tough, so be careful doing that side uh, because family can, can complicate it quite a bit. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I, I think like the, the legacy, the legacy business is an aspiration for a lot of entrepreneurs. You know, I want to build something that my son and daughter can, you know, work in and continue and build upon what I built upon as my, you know, parents did or whatever. Right. Um, but the reality is you're marrying work with family, which is, it's hard to marry anything with family. It's hard to marry a vacation with family, let alone like a business. Um, uh, and there's tremendous challenges to that. And I saw that my friend Aduna Weiner, you know, was working for years in her father's winery, uh, Bodega Cavasta Weiner in Argentina, which makes a uh, tremendous wine since the 1970s. And, um, and the business, she had left the business because she just found it too difficult to work with him. She had her own ideas and, and she didn't get along with one of her brothers as well. And, you know, this happens in any family business all the time. Uh, but she returned when the business was under, you know, financial strain and was in danger of, of really sort of collapsing um, uh, and, 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 you know, all sorts of legal complications and, and then add an Argentine on top of that. It's just super complicated. But, um, you know, for her, it was that question of like, you know, her role in that legacy is, was, was something she wanted. Um, and, and it gets incredibly complicated. It's how do you, how do you use that to your advantage? I mean, I spoke to other winery owners in Argentina when I was down there who were very successful at doing that, who have three, four generations in every person is able to have their entrepreneurial ideas and carve out a niche for themselves within the business and find a way to work professionally together 
so that that actually functions. Um, it's a hard thing to do. There's a reason why, you know, every generation of a family business, you get decreasing percentages of the families that succeed and the businesses that survive because it's hard to take, you know, what happens at work and marry it what happens at the dinner table and do that year after year, generation after generation. But for those that are able to succeed at it and actually work, make it work, it's incredibly powerful. you you know your sense of self, you know your sense of your your reason for being an entrepreneur. It's something you're basically born into. Your identity is something that's really been forged. Um, that sense of independence is something that you don't have to learn on your own. You're taught it by your family by just seeing them work on their own. Um, and you don't have to start something from scratch. You're building upon years and decades of knowledge that you've kind of that were started before you were even born. And so you have an advantage, right? You guys, again, both work for companies. I don't know if they're either of them are family owned. Are they family owned? For our companies? Yeah. yeah. The one I'm with is family owned. Right. Um, and so, you know, there's a reason why they do it. And, may, and maybe part of that reason is financial. It's like, look, there's good money in the mattress business. Like, don't, don't go squander it for something else. But I think another part of it is like, you know, we've already done over a hundred and X years you know, we've done the research, we've done the brand building, like so we have so much to build upon versus starting something out from scratch. Um, and sometimes you see people do it. Sometimes you see people not want to do anything with it at all. They're like, no, forget it. I'm going to go become an accountant or a lawyer or whatever. Um, and other times they're like, no, I'm going to start my own company that's going to be different because I'm not able to do the things that I want to within the confines of this. And so, you know, the family businesses to succeed aren't the ones that say, no, you're going to continue this legacy and do your thing. It is the ones that allow each generation to reinvent themselves as entrepreneurs within the business. And that doesn't mean scrapping everything, but it means giving them the ability to, um, to come up with their ideas, to have their independence and to, to, to take it into the direction that they see that. <laughs> I just Zoom. did that to mess with you. At that Normally, point. if we're sitting with each other, you can I can hit you in the leg. Uh, just a quick follow up: the the in, in that particular story mm. um, with the vineyard. Um, if you have so, if Dad starts the company and then you're coming up after that, I mean, I, Kinsley and I've seen it a, many times. Uh, the son or the daughter coming in after Dad, uh, they are also um, so entrepreneurial in spirit and thought and mind. And to your point, if you don't allow them to come in and carve out something that they can actually own and take further on than where it was, then you'll kill and crush that entrepreneurial spirit in the second and third generation. But, you know, dad's kind of saying, hey, look, I built this company. I know how things work. I know what can drive success. But in truth, some of what dad's doing is like he's still sending out direct mail when he should be looking at Google, Google AdWords, right, as an example. So the tension in that is really tough. And, and the female, and I'm so sorry, I don't remember her name. Aduna. Yeah. Aduna sounded like a rock star salesperson. And dad really needed her. And when she left, uh, things kind of slowed down. And when she came back, she's like, look, we got to go back into international markets. So I just find it so fascinating. And it's so many, it's so true for so many generational businesses. Yeah. That kind of like uh, story arc, right? Well, and, and what, what uh, you know, I forget who it was. Um, uh, I think Lori Union, who teaches family business at Babson College uh, in Boston. And, and who had taken over her father's uh, corrugated metal business in um, North Carolina, one of the Carolinas. Um, you know, she said, uh, you know, if, if they don't get that sense of independence by the time they're, they're you know, middle age, like 40s or 50s, it's just been beaten out of them. Um, and they just see it as another job, right? It's like, yes, the, my, my parents may own this business, but like, it's just another job. Like if I, if I can't exercise that independence of, of, of my ideas as an entrepreneur in a family business, then why am I here? Like I might as well just go take another job somewhere else. And that's what Arduna did. She left her family's business, I don't know, a decade ago, you know, moved back to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, where she was born and started working for um, Nespresso. Like she was selling Nespresso pods to and systems to restaurants and hotels and she was doing great. And she didn't have any, you know, she had responsibility, but like, 
you know, she got a paycheck every two weeks and she didn't have to worry about all that stuff. But after a while, it was like, oh, I'm just another employee of this giant multinational conglomerate. You know, what do I really want is like that independence. Like I want my ideas to be valued. I want my name to be worth something. I've got to, I've got to switch gears as we wind down before I forget to ask you this. Um, for a long time, you know, we, we have, very good mountain bike metaphor, Mark. I like that. <laughs> I, that was upside in the nano crank. Yeah. That was gears as we <laughs> disc break down. Uh, we deal with a lot of um, independent retailers, obviously selling mattresses and people at the retail sales level. So your retail sales associate. We talked to some organizations that do a very good job of bringing this entrepreneurial spirit within their own walls. We talked to a guy named Kevin Split. He's with City Furniture. It's a great business. They have this spirit. They have this culture. And one of the things we often talk about from a sales standpoint is what makes a, you know, open-ended questions are basically your secret weapon on the sales floor in a good way, because it's gonna reveal information that you can then map to the products you have out there. You're a journalist, you ask lots of questions. I remember, um, I think it was a guy named Cal Fussman. I think he was sitting down with Yasser Arafat, if I remember correctly, and he said, tell me about your dad. Everybody expected some, you know, the questioning to go really? in some direction, and it went this different direction. <laughs> I, had but it no revealed, I know Cal, I know Cal. I had no idea you know he Cal? interviewed Arafat, that's crazy. Yeah, and so I, he t- said, tell me about your dad, and it took the conversation in a very open direction that nobody expected it to go. What are some of those great questions that like journalists have as their secrets that people can use on the sales floor to build a relationship with people and reveal that good information? Oh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I can't speak for anyone, but I think it is, you know, I find it's like, what is that actual, the actual honest question you want to ask someone, right? Um, that's the one. Like, that's dude, what's be- up with that tie? Yeah. And I'm not wearing a tie. That's the funny thing, listeners. I'm not wearing a tie at all. It's just my chest hair. Um, That you've had uh, braided very nicely, by the way. Hey, fashion is passion. Um, I I think for this book, you know, the, the question I really kept asking people that that would get them to, to, to go to that deeper place was like, why, why do you do this? Like, what is the reason you could do this? You could, you clearly, you know, smart and educated. You can go work at this and this. Like, why do you do this? And I think that why more than anything is, is that, that question. So, you know, if you're a mattress retailer, it's like, hi, why are you here today? Like, <laughs> think about that in, the, in, a, in a mattress thing. It's like, it would seem kind of obvious, but it's like, well, you know, as I was explaining to you at the beginning of the thing, well, I bought a mattress two years ago at Sleep Country Canada and I'm really not happy with it and I don't know what to do. And um, my back is feeling like it needs assistance. So, um, so you know, I, I think it's like that, that real honesty, right? It's, it's that, that genuine sense of human curiosity and not some sort of trick that is the smart thing. It's like, what is the question you actually want to ask? My friend, Jeff Janakovo, our friend, uh, he's in the business. He, he had a, a great variation on that question, which was, tell me why you're shopping for a mattress today. Because it gets to the core of it. And it's really not a question. It's kind of a, a demand yeah. at that point. Well, nobody goes into a mattress store to browse anything other than mattresses, right? It's like, I mean, you I mean, do I get the feel that they're smart. Well, Alex. They're like, that- tell me, like, why are you shop- Why are you here today? Oh, I'm here to get a car. You know, like my friends in the business tell me that people Man. can be like that. So you got to get past I'm, it. I'm here. To- I'm here to shop the new spring line of mattresses said nobody ever. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, um, uh, so this whole, this is making me realize I, I got to deal with that mattress situation we talked about before, but <laughs> I guess I'll have that question. Although I'll be doing it from the window of the store because I can't go in because it's COVID. That's makes it difficult. It's I'll just buy from one of you two, but I don't know how we're going to, we're going to, cut the mattress we'll hook you. we my we wife have. will get half of an englander and i'll get half of a uh, <laughs> for the foot but regardless we will help you navigate all of it how's the that feet will be one marks and the, the head will be the other we'll do we'll cut it in four <laughs> and then I mean, we'll figure it out i like where this um, is going this, this sounds like a comfortable mattress conversation already. has gone off the 
off the rails, like so all I, good entrepreneurs will do with their ideas. All good podcasts, right? You have to yes. like take it places you, you don't. You're assuming it was on the rails at some um, point to begin b- with. Before we go, I, ha- I have a question for you. Gary V, big following, entrepreneurial guy, um, puts a lot of content out, tries to help people. You mentioned him a couple of times in your book. Um, is, is, is Gary V and what he says about entrepreneurship or kind of the the things he leads with is that a net positive or a net negative and explain that a little bit i you know i i've i've conflicted um feelings about him um you know i remember back when i was writing about wine and uh and he started his his you know online video series about wine out of his the parents wine store that he took over like that was so interesting and there was like he had this fresh approach. And I think a lot of stuff he says about entrepreneurs is very honest and refreshing and positive, you know, telling people that like failure is difficult and it's not something that you just got to like rah, rah do. And most entrepreneurship is about working hard and actually like finding success in those small things. And most people aren't going to be billionaires. Um, But I think a lot of it gets wrapped up in this, what one wonderful writer called entrepreneur porn, which is like, you know, here's the five things you need to know to succeed and come to my seminar and do my thing. And, you know, this is how you can crush it. And he's been very successful at that. Um, But I think it leads again to a lot of people sort of trying to fit into a specific narrative or a specific type or doing things in a specific way that may not suit them. And if it doesn't work for them, they become disillusioned because they have this idea of success that if you don't achieve the similar level of success as Gary V or his guests, then you yourself have failed. Um, when maybe that wasn't right for you in the first place, when maybe that wasn't something that that suits you in that way. Um, but you know, I, there's there's a lot worse people out there. I, I don't think Gary Vaynerchuk's bad at all. I think he's great and brilliant, and and you know, can be very funny and 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 enlightening sometimes. But again, it's like, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. You know, what book should I read? What course should I take? It's like, you don't really need, you know, do you have a product or idea or service that you want to sell? Then like go out there and do it and and do it your own way because that's what you have the freedom to do. Um, so don't worry about what someone says or the five ways to do it, or the six things you need to do or the diet you need to have or any of that stuff. If it's helpful, great. But if it's not, don't don't sweat it seems like there's so much information out there that like you said, it's, it's more people looking at entrepreneurship and gawking at it instead of thinking, what can I do that's, that's opposite of what's out there that would be really cool that people would really want or what's on my heart? Like what's my yeah. vision? What's my original vision? Yeah, because you're going you're gonna to be the one at the end of the day who has to live with this, right? Um, you're going to be the one who's going to be, you know, working in it and thinking about it and waking up and thinking about it and going to bed and thinking about it and thinking about it on your vacation and thinking about it over breakfast, thinking about it in the shower and, and you know, if it, the business is successful, you know, living with it and, and working with it for many, many years. Uh, and if it's not, then, you know, dealing with that. So you better have some reason deeper reason why you're doing it and and a good idea of what that's going to look like um because that'll get you through that that'll that'll be the thing that that holds you to that right and that's not a standardized thing that gary vaynerchuk or mark cuban or anyone else is gonna tell you um and and what's gonna work for them doesn't work for you well david it's been great having you on the show i'm glad that mark quinn listened to your book on tape yes yeah (laughs) Well, that old 85 Camry that he has is finally doing well. <laughs> do you, do you, Kinsley, do you also send out uh, memorandums to people? Uh, yeah, and with carbon copies for myself, so I know exactly what was sent over. It's a very well, good can, system. Go, go read David's last book, The Analog. The analog, system. yeah. That's right. Analog. Memorandums That's right. are coming analog. back, guys. <laughs> well, cool. David, you're, Everybody. You're great. Real quickly, where can people check out uh, your books? Like where's the best place for them to buy? Check out more info about you. Uh, Well, I will definitely say the best place to buy the book is at your local independent bookstore. Um, Every community has one or two or more, depending on what community you live in. Uh, But again, these are entrepreneurs in your community who did not open a bookstore to make millions of dollars. They did it because they're connected to that community. They wanted that community to have a place to encounter ideas, um, to have books recommended to them and, um, 
you know, it's a real shame when those, those stores uh, don't exist. And now obviously because of COVID there's uh, a precariousness to that. So please support them. Uh, if you wanted to buy it online and support them, I know a lot of the stores will take orders and deliver to your house, or there's a great site called uh, bookshop.org. And um, you can basically select an independent in your area and they'll, they'll fulfill it for them. They'll give them their commission. Um, so you're supporting both of them at the same time. And, um, and yeah, but you know, uh, I, I definitely think it, it's also available wherever books are sold. Uh, so if you want to just, you know, be a jerk and go to Amazon, go for it. Um, <laughs> you could do that too. Um, but it's all, uh, you know, I, I, I think obviously if you're buying a book about entrepreneurs, it might make sense to, you know, walk a walk there. I tell my, my next door neighbor, their daughter lives in Arizona and owns an independent bookstore oh, that cool. they purchased from, the owner who had started it many years before. And I told them a couple of days ago about bookshop.org because of just what you mentioned. Oh yeah. Great. Excellent. Well, cool. Well, thank you for that. And thanks for being on the show. And whenever we do have a follow-up, number one, we're happy to help you with any mattress needs you have. Don't try to pass off the Ikea with pea stains as a good mattress for your sister. Okay. No, don't do it. Not advised. Don't do that. Damn you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we had to get that on record just, just so she could hear it. Yeah, for sure. The organic latex that was taken from a tree in the Swiss Alps under 20 degree weather in the single month of February. That's the one you want right there. We know what a good story is. I'm literally reading about that tree on your website, Mark. So <laughs> thank, you. thank you. We have sheep. I have one named just for you, David. So. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And it comes with go. lamb chops. I like that. <laughs> um, well, thanks, guys. This was great. I'm glad we uh, we were able to do this um, after many rescheduled attempts. <laughs> um, uh, but I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you guys both so much for having me on. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. <laughs>